Hi, I'm Steve with the Sherwood of Prophecy Ministries, and this is part three of a series entitled, Does Anyone Really Know What Time It Is? In the last few presentations, you've seen convincing evidence that I presented to you out of the Bible and the Bible only. Evidence that you just can't ignore, nor deny. This presentation is a very special one. This deals with the issue of Israel and more so Jerusalem. Have you ever stopped to wonder why, when you turn on the news, that Israel's in the news all the time? Just a little place, no bigger than New Jersey. You don't hear New Jersey too much in the news, but what about this little place called Israel? And I'm telling you, we are about to see the final movements of the prophetic word before our very eyes. And today, I'm going to convince you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that this book called the Bible is absolutely accurate and can be reliable and depended on, and hopefully through this message, it will strengthen your faith and allow you to make that solid rock commitment to your Lord Jesus. Now is the time to wake up out of our sleep, for now is the time of salvation. May God bless you. This prophetic teaching is entitled, Jerusalem, Earth's Final Days. This is a second presentation in the series, Does Anyone Really Know What Time It Is? Let me start by giving you a couple of facts concerning this very important place in prophecy. Jerusalem is at the front and center in the Bible. It is mentioned 806 times, 660 times in the Old Testament, and 146 references are found in the New Testament. In addition, Zion is mentioned 108 times and is synonymous with this city. According to one prophet, this place is located at the center of the all nations. Some call it the navel of the world. Needless to say, Jerusalem is a most important location. There is some debate as to the original meaning of the Hebrew Yerushalam, but it is most commonly referred to as a city of peace. However, quite the contrary, history attests to the fact that this city has constantly been a center of conflict and controversy for thousands of years. During its long history, Jerusalem has been destroyed twice, besieged 23 times, attacked 52 times, captured and recaptured 44 times, and, as we will discover, here in the near future, the eyes of the world will be brought back to this arena just at the time, just before Yeshua returns. Let's begin with a prophecy that verifies this from the prophet Zechariah. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. This prophetic scenario places Jerusalem as a place of contention for all the countries that surround it. Evidently, something is going down in this place that will not only bring attention from the local countries, but the prophecy then adds, It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. In this day, all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. Never has there ever been a time in the records of history where Jerusalem has gathered the attention of the entire world against it. There are many prophecies found in the Bible that verify this very event. I wonder, just what could happen over there that would bring so much attention and adversity against it? This same prophet adds to this troubling scenario. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when a spoil taken from you will be divided among you. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Hundreds of years later, Yeshua Jesus also prophesied that this would happen. Let's take a look at what he prophesied. On several occasions, Jesus ties Jerusalem into the limelight of prophetic action revolving around end time circumstances. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee into the mountains any of those listening to Jesus' prophetic declaration would have known where the holy place was. Oh, and by the way, it wasn't Rome, Mecca, or Medina in that day, and it isn't now. Again, in another prophecy given by Jesus, he singles out this event and gives a clue that war is imminent. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee into the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of it other depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. 
Now notice the time in which this significant event is placed in. Jerusalem, who are surrounded by armies, this will happen at the day of vengeance when all things will be fulfilled. This event will usher in the battle of Armageddon and the remaining last day prophecies fulfilling the events just before Yeshua Jesus returns. Obviously, this hasn't happened yet, so this prophecy is contained within the framework of those prophecies having not yet happened. Many believe this prophecy was fulfilled at the year 70 AD when the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem and destroyed it. But guess what? Jerusalem is rebuilt, it is back in the daily news again, and as you will discover, something much larger is looming on the horizon. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. In the context of this prophecy, Jesus clearly is speaking of those who are living in Jerusalem. Someday, in this holy city, they will experience a great trouble and distress coming down on its inhabitants. This is not a pretty picture here. Let's look. They will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. According to Jesus, Jerusalem will be trampled on by non-Jewish invaders and not only did he predict the attack on Jerusalem, but issued a set time of trouble allotted toward this city. Jesus referred to it as the time of the Gentiles. There is a prophecy in the book of Revelation that foretells this very event. This prophecy clearly reveals a specific time in which the Gentiles will trample down the holy city. Now let's go over and take a look. It is here we discover the time of the Gentiles. In this context, in raptured and vision, John was told to measure the temple, and the concept of measurement alludes to judgment. And contextually, this relates to the holy place and those regarded as worshipers there. John is given instruction to leave the measuring alone outside his holy place. And please remember, everyone living in that day would have known this place as Jerusalem, and more so, the Temple Mount. And someday, this place will be given into the hands of the Gentiles for a determined point of time. Let's read it. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. Putting this together, we learn that non-Jewish invaders will be trampling on Jerusalem for a period of three and a half years. In the book of Daniel and Revelation, this is a very significant time, and this is yet in the future. It is here at this time the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will bring the whole world's attention back to this small little place. Why here, you ask? Well, for a moment, let's go back to the historical biblical record and try to understand how this place became so important. In God's grand design, Jehovah God searched for earth for someone who was faithful to him. God chose a man by the name of Abram. He told Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house. To a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Yahweh had in mind to make a great nation of the faithful through the family tree of Abram. Then, then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then looking down into the future, God tells Abram in a dream that at some point in time they will go to Egypt and stay there 400 years. Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward, they will come out with great possessions. In order to get this accomplished, Abraham would have to have a child in her old age and in the course of time, Abraham and his wife had a miracle baby. Both Sarah and Abraham had a son in their 90s. When God told Abraham, he fell on his face and began to laugh. When Sarah heard the news, she laughed. And when they named their son Isaac, which means he laughs, then, as a special son grew, God told Abraham, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will tell you. Jehovah God led this faithful warrior to the mountain of Moriah. And as you will learn, this mountain 
was handpicked by God himself as a special place. It was there Abraham produced faith to the point of even sacrificing his son, but God had a different plan. As Abraham raised his knife, his hand was stopped, and many, many years later, God did in fact provide the ultimate sacrifice. Yes, a people of Yahweh had been born. The child of promise was born, thus initiating the, the fulfillment of the promise. Isaac grew up, and along came Jacob. His sons were the sons of Israel, and through a very sinister situation in which one of their brothers were sold into slavery, what they meant for evil, Yahweh blessed for good in this growing family. At some point in time, Joseph became a leader in Egypt and was entrusted with great influence. A famine hit the land of promise, and the sons of Israel wound up down in Egypt, and they became enslaved just as Yahweh had told Abraham 400 years later, Moses led Israel out of bondage, and after f long 40 years, they wound up back at that very special location again. And it was there, at some point in time, God instructed David to purchase a piece of property from the Jebusites. This was the place that the mountain of Moriah was located. The place where Abraham, hundreds of years beforehand, raised his knife in obedience to God's command to sacrifice, it was at that place where God himself chose to dwell with his people. Throughout the Old Testament, God made claim to the place that he called his holy city. It was there, at this very location, his subsequent construction of a palace made Jerusalem a royal city. His decision to rule from Jerusalem elevated a city poorly situated for either trade or military activity to a capital status. David transformed Jerusalem into a religious center of his kingdom by bringing into it the Ark of the Covenant. Although David was not allowed to construct a temple, the arrival of the Ark forever linked Jerusalem with Yahweh's own people. So eventually, Sodom began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on a threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. It was at this special place, the mountain of Moriah, where the Almighty would choose to dwell with his people, and God proclaimed to Israel. Of all the places all over this earth, it was Jerusalem where Yahweh chose to place his name. It was there where he would make the pronouncement, This will be my place forever, as it is written, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen, I will put my name forever. Throughout the ancient writings, the sovereign God made claim to Jerusalem as his. In this place, King David declared, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in his holy mountain. It is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. This mountain is his holy mountain, his holy city, and would forever be regarded as his. Throughout the testimony of Scripture, trouble and disobedience drove his special people, Israel, from Jerusalem into distant lands. And then he would bring them back to this very same spot, his holy mountain, his city, the city of the great king. In another declaration, the prophet Daniel calls Yahweh's place, your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain. In Scripture, Jerusalem is synonymous with holy city, great city, holy place, holy mountain, Mount Moriah, and Mount Zion. There are several other testimonies in Scripture where the Almighty calls Jerusalem his place. This is why there's so much controversy on the many claims of who Jerusalem's uh, place is. Three of the major religions make claims that Jerusalem is theirs. The Jews call it their eternal capital, Islam says it has never been Jewish, and Christians regard Jerusalem as their eternal home when Yeshua, Jesus, comes back. Again, the Bible predicted that Israel would leave Jerusalem because Israel forgot the one who chose them, blessed them, protected them, and called them his own. Typically, once they were prosperous, they would turn to other gods and worship idols of wood, stone, and precious metals. Then Yahweh would send a prophet in their midst, warn them to turn, and they would ultimately ignore the messenger until judgment would commence and Israel would be taken from God's holy mountain. And according to the prophet Jeremiah, they would go into captivity 70 years. Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonian army and taken into captivity in the pronounced time appointed. This whole land shall be a desolation, Jeremiah declares, and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. At the appointed time, 
Yahweh used a nation of invaders to attack the great impenetrable Babylonian kingdom. Cyrus, a heathen ruler, was named by the prophet Isaiah long before the monarch was even born. Isaiah prophesied in the latter portion of the 8th century that that was 150 years before Cyrus came to the throne. It happened exactly as it was written. The Persians diverted the Euphrates rivers into a canal so that the water level dropped thigh high, which allowed the invading forces to march directly through the riverbed to enter at night and on October 29th, 539 BC. Cyrus himself entered the city of Babylon and conquered it. And through this amazing victory, Cyrus issued a decree for the Jews who had been in captivity to go back again to their homeland. It is recorded in the historical record, the Lord God, the God of heaven, has given me all kingdoms of the earth. He has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. So go to Jerusalem and rebuild the house of the Lord God of Israel, for he is a God who is in Jerusalem. So back they go again. And as it was prophesied, they returned. And Ezra records this in his biblical historical record. Now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. And at the appointed time, throughout the history of the Bible, God brought them back to his place. Ultimately, after his son Jesus was born, God brought him to his place, Jerusalem, and his people to worship and to care for. However, the Bible proclaimed, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. You would find in his short a time here on earth, Jerusalem was his special place. It was there that he stood in the temple on the mountain of Moriah. Speaking of himself, he declares, There's one standing here greater than the temple. Then at the appointed time, exactly as the prophet Zechariah prophesied, Jesus rode into Jerusalem as the people shouted, Blessed to the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some understood the prophecy, but most of the religious leaders did not have a clue. It was at this time he approached the holy city, and the scripture testifies. And when he approached, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you would have known, even you, as fleshy this in your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Then he makes a very alarming statement concerning Jerusalem. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children with you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Yes, the time had arrived. Jesus would give up his life to save the world from their transgressions. This event took the Jews by surprise. Why? Because they did not know the time of their visitation. They saw the miracles, they had, had the writings of the prophets, they saw him raise Lazarus from the dead, and it was then they wanted to get rid of the evidence, but this was nothing new. Just before he was to give his life to complete the plan laid from the foundation of the world, Jesus shared his heart concerning his father's place and told Israel, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together, as hens gather her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Then Jesus pronounces judgment upon it. Because the Jews rejected his invitation, Jesus rejected and removed his blessing from Israel. He made this stark declaration. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Yes, the blessing of Israel will be placed on a nation and a people who accepted his offer of salvation through his sacrifice for the redemption of his people worldwide. Then the deal is sealed by this heartbreaking account. Yes, Jesus was led to the authorities to appoint a death sentence on the sinless son of Jehovah. As he was brought before the governor who found no fault in Jesus, he asked the maddened crowd of religious leaders, what shall I do with Jesus who's called to Christ? And they all said to him, let him be crucified. Why, what evil has he done? The emperor asked. And they cried out all the more saying, let him be crucified. Then the maddened crowd brought a curse down on them by the pronouncement, his blood be on us and on our children. And it was there in Jerusalem that he would die as the testimony states. It was on the first month, 14th day, 
that the prophecy of the Passover lamb was made complete. It was there in his own place, crucified by the ones that he had chosen, that he died. But that would not be the end of the story. Three days later, he rose from the grave and death was not able to hold him any longer. And it would be his plan to go away and then someday come back with a new Jerusalem to offer at his arrival again. But before this would happen, much would transpire to fulfill the prophecies before he would return. Remember his declaration? Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. This was a shocking prediction. It must have been very difficult for Jesus to pronounce judgment on his place where he had put his name. Exactly how Jesus declared it, it did happen the same way. And a historical record testifies. The Great Revolt began in the year 66, originating in the Roman and Jewish religious tensions. The crisis escalated due to anti-taxation protests and attacks upon Roman citizens. The Romans responded by plundering the Jewish temple and executing up to 6,000 Jews in Jerusalem, prompting a full-scale rebellion. And after around four years of strife among the Jews and Romans, Titus moved to besiege the center of rebel resistance in Jerusalem in early 70 AD. The first two walls of Jerusalem were breached within three weeks, but a stubborn rebel standoff prevented the Roman army from breaking the third and thickest wall. Following a brutal seven-month siege, during which zealot infighting resulted in burning of the entire food supply of the city, the Romans finally succeeded in breaching the defenses of the weakened Jewish forces in the summer of 70. And just as Jesus prophesied, the Jewish historian Josephus writes, It was so thoroughly laid even with the ground that those that dug it up to the foundation that there was nothing to make those that came there believe it had ever been inhabited. Wow. And in honor of Titus's triumph, the Ark of Titus in Rome is an archeological verification of the historical record. However, even though this apparent final solution happened, this would not be the final chapter in the history of God's chosen people. Several hundred years before, the prophet Jeremiah foretold of a day of Israel's return back to where the Almighty placed his name again. My friends, don't think that I'm picking on the Jewish people here. I just want to let you know up front, I'm not a replacement theologist. I don't believe that, that uh, the Jews were replaced by Christians. I believe that God still has his hand over the seed of Abraham. And if we are Abraham's seed, we're heirs according to the promise, but Israel itself is still there. He's brought about 2,000 years uh, uh, later from uh, being dispersed all over the earth. He's brought them back, his hand is on them, and at a time of trouble, many are gonna turn as stars into righteousness forever and ever. You can count on it because a sure word of prophecy declares it. Jeremiah proclaimed, For behold, the days are coming that I will bring back my captivity, my people Israel, and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Then the prophet then goes on to prophesy, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. He then continues, I will not make a complete end of you, but will correct you in justice, and will not let you go altogether unpunished. Oh, how hard and inconceivable is this judgment of the Almighty. History records that Israel was punished harshly many times. It is a very serious thing to ignore the pleading and the commands of the Almighty. Yes, throughout the historical record, time and time again, rebellion rose up, its ugly head, and correction came to turn the remnant back to what was really important. It was all about worship of the one true God. If the Father loves his children, he will correct them. Yes, history testifies to the enormous trouble that had befallen the Jewish people. In one of the saddest chapters of world history, Hitler gathered up Jews from all over Europe, taking prisoners and transporting them to extermination camps. This was the most horrific tragedy ever recorded concerning the Jewish people. And as you will discover, this again would not be the end of the story. A UN conference on international organization convened on 11th of February, 1945, following meetings at Yalta, President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Churchill, and Premier Joseph Stalin declared their resolve 
to establish a general international organization to maintain peace and security. And it was out of this worldwide event the United Nations emerged. And then, May 14, 1948, the Declaration of the Establishment of the State of Israel. In this, it was announced that the catastrophe which recently befell the Jewish people, the massacre of millions of Jews in Europe, was another clear demonstration of the urgency of solving the problem of its homelessness by reestablishing in Eretz Israel the Jewish state. Israel is recognized as a nation. Israel's territory, 8,019 square miles. That makes it the smallest place other than El Salvador or New Jersey. And on May 14, 1948, the British mandate ended and the state of Israel was established. Then, Israel's invitation. The state of Israel will be open for Jewish immigration and for the ingathering of the exiles. It will be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisaged by the prophets of Israel. Isn't that amazing that they recognize the ancient prophets on this? Wow, just as soon as this invitation came out, what happened? Jerusalem began a war. Jerusalem defended its new state, but lost Jerusalem to the Jordanian forces. All the Jews who lived within the walls of the ancient city of Jerusalem were either killed or driven out by the Jordanians. On May 15, 1948, the ongoing civil war transformed into an interstate conflict between Israel and the Arab states following the Israeli Declaration of Independence the previous day. A combined invasion by Egypt, Jordan, Syria, together with the expeditionary forces of Iraq, entered Palestine's vial between Israel and Jordan after the war, and Israelis ruling West Jerusalem as Jordanians ruling East Jerusalem within the old city. And that's how it stayed for a while. Then came another ugly war. Our forces are now entirely ready not only to repulse the aggression, but to initiate the act of liberation itself and to explode the Zionist presence in the Arab homeland. I, as a military man, believe the time has come to enter into the, a battle of annihilations. Relations between Israel and its neighbors had fully never normalized following the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, and in the period leading up to June 1967, tensions became dangerously heightened. As a result, following the mobilization of Egyptian forces along the Israeli border of the Sinai Peninsula, Israel launched a series of preemptive strikes against Egyptian airfields on June the 5th, 1967. The Egyptian president set out in the open, our basic objective will be the destruction of Israel. We will not accept any coexistence with Israel, and today the issue is not the establishment of peace between the Arab states and Israel. The war with Israel is in effect since 1948. The King of Jordan said, today they will know that the Arabs are arranged for battle the critical hour has arrived. The armies of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon are poised on the borders of Israel to face the challenge while standing behind us are the armies of Iraq, Algeria, Kuwait, Sudan, and a whole Arab nation. This act will astound the world. And it sure did. Well, Israel astounded the world. On the morning of June 5th, Israel launched a devastating attack on Arab air power, destroying about 300 Egyptian, 50 Syrian, and 20 Jordanian aircraft, mostly on the ground. And this action virtually eliminated the Arab air forces. Then, the greatest moment in Jewish history in 2,000 years, Jerusalem and the Temple Mount are reclaimed, and a great general announced, Surely, we're going to go into the old city of Jerusalem that all generations have dreamed about. We will be the first to enter the old city, and shortly afterwards, the Temple Mount is in our hands. I repeat, the Temple Mount is in our hands. Then the elated proclamation, the city of God, the site of the Temple, the Temple Mount, and the Western Wall, the symbol of the nation's redemption. Indeed, we have not forgotten you. Jerusalem, our holy city, and our glory. Shortly thereafter, sinister plans and groups were organized to wrestle Jerusalem back out of Jewish control again. Arab leaders continue to insist that Jerusalem was an Arab city. That myth is used to implement a strategy to wrest partial control of Jerusalem from Israel and to make Jerusalem the capital of a Palestinian state. 
It is also part of a long-range strategy to destroy the Jewish state. Moving ahead a few years, again, another war ensued. October 6, 1973, hoping to win back territory lost to Israel during the Third Arab-Israeli War in 1967, Egypt and Syrian forces launched a coordinated attack against Israel on Yom Kippur, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. On the Golan Heights, approximately 180 Israeli tanks faced an onslaught of 1,400 Syrian tanks. Along the Suez Canal, 500 Israeli defenders were attacked by 80,000 Egyptians. There should not have been a chance in a trillion that Israel would have survived this unexpected viciousness against them. Against Israel were nine Arab states, including four non-Middle Eastern nations, actively aided the Egyptian-Syrian war effort. The Jewish state was against Iraq, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Tunisia, Kuwait, Libya, Algeria, Sudan, and Morocco. Miraculously, Israel survives the odd again. Israel's survival could only be explained one way. The Almighty Jehovah was with them. And throughout the years, the tension has remained and there has been several attempts to bring healing to a festering sore in the Middle East. At this time, Israel continued their inspection and Palestinians along with the whole Arab world continued to fume at this expansion of Jewish occupation of what they refer to as Arab land. As you can tell here, Israel has gained large amounts of territory formerly under Palestinian control. And then here came the game changer. The provocation that triggered the protest marking the start of the second intifada in September 2000 was then opposition leader Ariel Sharon's controversial visit to the Temple Mount accompanied by 1,000 riot police. Sharon was deliberately reiterating Israeli claims to the contested area in light of the then Prime Minister Ehud Barak's U.S. brokered peace negotiations with PLO leader Yasser Arafat, which included discussions on how the two sides could share Jerusalem. The 35-acre site is the biggest obstacle to peace and, as Mr. Sharon asserted yesterday, an inalienable part of the Jewish state. The Temple Mount is in our hands and will remain in our hands. It is the holiest site in Judaism and it is the right of every Jew to visit the Temple Mount, he said after a descent. Then all heck broke loose. Yasser Arafat at the United Nations says, we're going forward toward our national sovereignty over Palestinian lands and establishing our independent Palestinian state and its capital, Holy Jerusalem, the heart of Palestine, of Arabs, and heart of believers. Allah willing, on this path, until every boy of the boys of Palestine and every girl of the girls of Palestine raises a Palestinian flag over the walls of Jerusalem, its mosque and churches, Jerusalem, the state and capital of Palestine. Along with this, other Arab leaders incited war acts to remove Israel from their occupation. Enter in Saddam Hussein. A special announcement was made to the war widows of West Bank. Saddam would pay $25,000 American money to the family of each suicide bomber as an enticement for others to volunteer for martyrdom in the name of the Palestinian people. Yasser Arafat and Saddam had become partners to try destroying the Jewish people and remove them by suicide bombers. In this article entitled, Hussein and Arafat, Birds of a Feather, How They Engineered the Bloody in Jerusalem, it reports thousands of Iraqis had taken to the streets waving guns and calling for the liberation of Palestine under Hussein's leadership. Their banners read, Here we come Saddam, here we come Jerusalem. You see, Saddam's intent was clear. Iraq's madman was creating a Jerusalem Liberation Army. According to this report, Iraq began training for what it called the Jerusalem Liberation Army. Saddam Hussein had announced a creation of a 21 division strong command to be used against Israel. Baghdad has claimed that more than 6 million Iraqis had volunteered to serve in it. Because of this, another move by Israel to guard Jerusalem was building huge barrier walls. As far as the Arabs were concerned, this was just another reason to destroy the Jews. Although the walls began to slow down the murderous intent against Israel, the facts speak loud and clear. From September 28, 2000 to December 31, 2005, terrorism against Israel 
uh, amounted to 25,770 terrorist attacks. 147 suicide bombings caused 47% of all the deaths. 1,084 were killed, 7,454 injured. 82% of dead and wounded were civilians between 2000 and 2004. Finally, the wall stopped 90% of the carnage against the inhabitants of Jerusalem. But they had other concerns cropping up in addition to this. As you can see, this provides a pretty solid fence to keep the terrorists out. But there are many vehemently opposed to this, one of those being the Palestine Stop the Wall project. Enter in Iran. Former Iranian President Ravistani, when using a nuclear bomb against Israel, said, if one day the world of Islam comes to possess of the weapons currently in Israel's possession, on that day, this method of global arrogance will come to a dead end. This is because the use of a nuclear bomb in Israel will leave nothing on the ground. You see, the Islamic Republic of Iran began to sympathize with the Palestinians to the point of reckless hatred and support to rid the Jewish occupiers from Islamic land. 2005, Iran's new president, Ahmadinejad, really stirs up Israel by declaring Israel is a cancerous tumor in the heart of the Muslim world which should be removed. This guy knew that there could be no Iranian domination with Israel existing. Apparently, he had come up with another option. Iran's president has already called for Israel to be wiped off the map. Iran's conservative president has said that Israel should be moved to Europe. This hatred involved into a much wider base of terrorism support to accomplish the mission. The one that actually stays behind the scenes, but actually runs the Islamic Republic, has only one goal in mind. Here's an article of the Jerusalem Post. Khomeini says, Zionist regime will disappear from the map. His mission? The fake Zionist regime will disappear from the landscape of geography. He has gathered terrorist armies to help him to accomplish his sinister goals. Enter in Iran-backed Hamas. This article out of Forbes says, Hamas will not recognize Israel. It is interesting that Hamas was voted into Palestinian leadership. They have came out in the open and said, we will never recognize the usurper Zionist government and will continue our jihad-like movement until the liberation of Jerusalem. Hamas calls for forming an Arab army to liberate occupied Jerusalem. This article goes on to say, the Hamas Department of Refugee Affairs urged Palestinian Premier Asmel Hayanea to work on forming an Arab army to liberate the occupied Islamic city of Jerusalem from occupation. They boldly have stated, we are confident that the battle for liberating Jerusalem has become closer than ever, and we are promised an imminent victory by God. Palestinian President Abbas has been more than vicious and adamant in claiming Jerusalem as a Palestinian capital. His claim? We know that the Israelis are trying to change its landmarks, to change our land, and to build over our homes and over the graves of our people in order to erase the traces of the Palestinian people, but they will not succeed. Without East Jerusalem, there will be no state, there will be no Palestinian state. There's something very important about this place, and as we will see, all roads are leading there. It has been such an enormous controversy. In February 2012, 400 participants from 50 countries and organizations gathered together to an international conference for Jerusalem. It was there they stated of their complaints. Of paramount importance is the disclosure of Israel's deeds at falsifying history and archaeology by means of destruction, omission, modification, and fabrication of historical and archaeological facts. By contrast, an emphasis should be put on overwhelming set of evidence which spread across the city, showing its rooted past as an inalienable part of Palestine and a holy place for all divine religions. The cultural and religious identity of the residents and landscape should be reaffirmed and protected politically, economically, and legally, and the ultimate goal being a reassertion of Jerusalem as a city capital of the Palestinian state. Furthermore, the holy city of Jerusalem is falsely called the eternal capital of Israel by Netanyahu and other Zionist leaders, who clearly state that Jerusalem is non-negotiable. 
Such statements and related actions by the Zionists are absolutely inconsistent with all of the relevant United Nations resolutions on Jerusalem and contrary to the principles of international law. It was further declared that Jerusalem and all of Palestine need to be liberated, redeemed, and restored as a land of and coexistence by people of the world from all religious and cultural backgrounds. As part of this movement, and at the invitation of Palestinians, we decided to organize a global march to Jerusalem, aimed at raising awareness of the mortal threat to Jerusalem and of all of Palestine by the hand of Zionists and helping us move closer to the day of freedom. Here was the bottom line and conclusion of the conference. Without the liberation of Jerusalem, no real peace and stability can be achieved in the Middle East or farther afield. But believe me, Israel's leadership is not budging a bit on it. Israel's not going to give Palestinians any concessions of Jerusalem. Netanyahu clearly articulated his stance and declared, 44 years ago, IDF soldiers realized the prophet's vision and returned Jerusalem to its proper place. Jerusalem will never be divided. There's nothing more holy to us than Jerusalem. We'll protect Jerusalem, its unity, and we'll build and develop it. So in 2012, in the March on Jerusalem, global participation in the march confirms to the world that these policies and practices of the racist state of Israel against Jerusalem and its people are a crime not only against Palestinians, but against all humanity. We aim to highlight the cause of Jerusalem, the city of peace, which are considered the key to peace and war in the region and the world. Hello, anyone awake yet? The people of the world therefore have taken it upon themselves to prevent this abomination by mobilizing themselves in every part of the world and representing all religious, humanitarian, and cultural backgrounds aimed at guarding the city of peace from becoming a wasteland. Hmm, without their intervention what? What would happen? And the momentum continues. A couple of months after the march, as Egypt had its presidential campaign, Muslim Brotherhood representative in campaigning for Morsi made this very shocking statement before the world. Our capital won't be Mecca or Medina, but Jerusalem. Millions of Shaheeds will march on the city. The whole world should know, and we say it clearly, our goal is Jerusalem, we shall pray in Jerusalem, and if not, we shall die as martyrs on its ruins. Wow. February 28, 2014. Iranian official declares, we are preparing to liberate Jerusalem. Iran Commander General Mohammad Reza Naki announced that the Islamists are angry and want to destroy the U.S. and Israel to restore Jerusalem as an Islamic city. November 4th, 2014, former Jordanian Prime Minister said the Christian West must help the Muslims expel the Jews from Jerusalem. We will defend Jerusalem and will not allow the Jews to be in it. Not a single Jew will remain in Jerusalem. This is out of the question. I say this loud and clear on behalf of the entire Palestinian people and of the entire Arab and Islamic nation. Entering in Hezbollah. Hezbollah is an extremely complicated enemy. It's a determined terrorist group, a power political player, a mighty military, and an accomplished intelligence organization, formidable and ruthless. And no one underestimates its capabilities Iran is supplying this terror group for one reason only, to help destroy Israel. In a video not too long ago, Hezbollah's leader declared his readiness to send his terrorist army into Jerusalem and conquer it. Listen to this very determined statement from Nasrallah. Till martyrdom, we are going toward Al-Quds, the Arabic for Jerusalem. O Zionist, we will not give up. Israel must be eliminated from the earth. You just can't get much plainer than that. Have you noticed in many occasions, you find the holy site of the Dome on the Rock somewhere lurking in the background of these pictures? And there's a larger picture here, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Hezbollah is hiding 100,000 missiles. Out of the times of Israel, Hezbollah has an estimated 1,000 short-range rockets capable of striking northern Israel, several thousand missiles that can reach Tel Aviv, and central Israel, and hundreds more that can strike the entire country. In a recent Jerusalem Post article, 
Israel defense chief sees war with Hezbollah as a matter of when, not if. And if that army planners understand that the next military action in the north will be the most difficult we will ever know. They know it's coming. July 9th, 2014, the Palestinian Fatah. With these rockets, we will liberate our Jerusalem. With these rockets, we will crush the Zionist enemy in sensitive areas where it didn't expect us to crush it, our law willing. Well, it's pretty obvious where this is all ahead. The prophet saw it, and it is written, and it must come to pass. And it is. December 2014, out of Israel National News, Hamas shows off army ready to conquer Jerusalem. What a friendly group of people this is. September 2014, the Islamic State terrorists are active throughout the region and looking to move into Jordan, Gaza, and Lebanon. But their goal is Jerusalem, just like Hamas. Islamic State and Hamas are one, and let us make no mistake, they are from the same village and in the branches of the same tree. So what is motivating this movement to such violence toward a peaceful people? Well, let's look. It's called the Quran, their holy book. In their book, it declares, your Lord inspired the angels with the message, terrorize the unbelievers. Therefore, smite them on their necks and every joint and incapacitate them. Strike off their heads and cut off each of their fingers and toes. How about this religion of peace verse? They should be murdered or crucified on their hands and the feet should be cut off on opposite sides or they should be imprisoned. Even though Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran, they persist in moving in and taking it over with this terrible pursuance. ISIS says it out in the open, we will conquer Jerusalem. May 21st, 2015, the headlines, ISIS trying to make inroads in Jerusalem. How about this article just three weeks ago, November 10th, 2015. Hamas, we're closer than ever to liberating Jerusalem. It says, the Al-Quds Intifada opened the gates to the liberation of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, adding that the Intifada continues to escalate every day. How about these headlines one month ago? Hamas were closer than ever to liberating Jerusalem. It says in this article that they are going to be heading to Jerusalem at some point in time. And Turkey has called for Muslims to invade Jerusalem. Turkish President Erdogan, in trying to bring resolution to the Islamic madness, believes, unfortunately, we the Muslims lost our aim to head towards Jerusalem. The water of our eyes froze, making us blind. And our hearts that was destined to beat for Jerusalem is now instead condition for rivalry being in a state of war with each other. So what are the Muslims so angry about? Why the rage? And why is Jerusalem so important? Jews and Muslims are intensifying their struggle over the city's most passionately contested holy site. Will it lead to war? In Jerusalem, Palestinians and Israelis live in close proximity. That has made the ancient city a focal point for extremists on both sides of the conflict. In the past year, many of the outbreaks of violence between the two peoples have taken place in Jerusalem, the much contested holy city that both Israelis and Palestinians claim as their capital, but which Israel Control, an EU official noted that the tensions, mistrust, and violence which has accompanied developments in the city in the course of the year have reached extremely high levels. One of the key reasons for the higher tensions is the intensifying dispute over the status of the Haram al-Sharif complex. The holy site has played a pivotal role in many large uprisings in the last few years, more namely the Temple Mount. The vast majority of Israelis insist that a united Jerusalem will be the eternal capital of the Jewish state. With equal insistence, the Palestinians say that the Arab eastern part of Jerusalem, where the Al-Aqsa Mosque and Dome of the Rock are, are sacred Islamic sites, and that's where they're located, and that should be the capital of their new state. Netanyahu will not budge an inch on Jerusalem. On Jerusalem Day, he reiterated, Jerusalem won't become once again a wounded and bisected city. We will forever keep Jerusalem united under Israeli sovereignty. Ownership of the Al-Aqsa Mosque is a contentious issue in the Israel-Palestinian conflict. Israel claims sovereignty over the mosque along with all the Temple Mount, the Noble Sanctuary. 
but Palestinians hold the custodianship of the site through the Islamic wall. As we will discover, the larger issue is who will be king of the mountain where the Temple Mount sits. Everyone wants a piece of this holy mountain. Although Israel has retained security control of the area and frequently cites security concerns to bar Palestinian access, it recognizes the authority of the Islamic Waqf religious body supervised by the Jordanian government to manage the area. Uh, Jews and other non-Muslims may visit the compound, but only Muslims are permitted to pray as they do in the tens of thousands every Friday when access is open. But the Jews are inciting things. In this flyer, they, it says in this, we are invited to go up the Temple Mount to thank and praise the creator of this world, to declare that healthy leadership is a beginning in the complete control of Temple Mount cleansing the place of the enemies of Israel, the land thieves, and building the temple on the ruins of the mosque without any fear whatsoever. The Temple Mount has been a place of frequent riot and lawlessness. This Palestinian publication entitled Al-Aqsa, The Banner for Struggle says, the latest escalation came as a result of inflammatory statements from Israeli hardliners threatening to destroy the mosque and build in its place a Jewish temple. Hello, the Muslims believe Israel wants to destroy Al-Aqsa Mosque. Both Fatah and Hamas have generated and sustained religious hatred by disseminating the libel that Israel is attempting to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque. With close to 100% of Palestinians identifying themselves as believing Muslims, this claim is highly inflammatory and is often combined with a call to defend Al-Aqsa from the Jews. The Al-Aqsa libel includes numerous fabrications, uh, such as Israel was behind a mosque fire in 1969, Israel is currently digging under the mosque in order to topple it, Israel's plan to replace it with a new temple, Israel is preparing a missile attack on the mosque, and more. This libel has been actively promoted since 1998. Out of Al-Monitor, November 24th, 2015, a couple of weeks ago. Will the building of a third temple destroy the Jewish state? Behind the current wave of terrorism lies the Arabs' fear of a change in the status quo on the Temple Mount. And this feeling is not totally disconnected from reality. Now a terror binge has begun. Here's a screenshot from the activist group's drawing of its planned third temple, superimposed on a dome on the rock, which makes clear the explosive nature of the proposal. How about this? Every year they have been celebrating the International Temple Mount Awareness Day and that celebrates the promise of a rebuilding of a holy temple in Jerusalem and the revolution in temple consciousness that is taking place in Israel. This awareness clearly articulates the main issues to be resolved. The battle for Jerusalem is actually far from over, they propagate. Anyone who has ascended to the holy temple mount can bear witness to the fact that at the place of the Holy Temple is being held hostage by those who continually seek our destruction and the destruction of all that is sacred. The battle for the land of Israel rages all around us. Jerusalem lies at the very heart of the struggle. Another equally involved, jealous group that wants to turn the Temple Mount over from Islamic control is the Temple Mount Faithful. Under Gershon Solomon, their number one mission is this liberating the Temple Mount from Arab Islamic occupation. The Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque were placed on this Jewish and Biblical holy site as a specific sign of Islamic conquest and domination. The Temple Mount can never be consecrated to the name of God without removing these pagan shrines. And he heads up that group that is around Jerusalem, parading around. They are putting around temple cornerstones around Jerusalem, already cut out for the temple. The Palestinians and the Muslim world who believe Al-Aqsa is, and a Temple Mount is, Arab, are incensed with in-your-face incitements by Jewish hardliners hell-bent on building a third temple. The Muslim response? The Al-Aqsa Mosque has been an Islamic mosque since its establishment, and it will remain so until Judgment Day. We should not accept that Jerusalem will be the capital of anyone else. It is the capital of the Muslims. We ask Allah, to protect the al Aqsa Mosque from the filth of the aggressors. The old city is a symbol for Christian, Muslims, and Jews. More than that, the al Aqsa compound is recognized by the United Nations as the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Israeli threats to destroy it are an affront to humanity. Al-Jariza 
recently published an article, Third Temple in Jerusalem, Mission Impossible for Messianic Zealots. While there is certainly no formal Israeli government plan to partition the Temple Mount or destroy the Dome on the Rock, it was reported and suggested by the chief's rabbi and the army immediately after conquering the 37-acre site 48 years ago and even attempting on several occasions by the Jewish underground that there has been a marked increase in visits by nationalist activists in the last five years. What began as a fringe activity has become much more acceptable in Israel's mainstream, especially during Jewish holidays specifically tied to the mountain of Moriah. This, of course, is an exact opposition to Islam's holy book and a call to war concerning the sacred mosque. In the holy book it says, kill them wherever you find them and drive them out from where they drove you out and persecution is severer than slaughter and do not fight with them at the sacred mosque until they fight with you. But if they do fight you, then slay them. Such is the recompense of the unbelievers. This back and forth war rhetoric will eventually bring down the house. Israel's prime minister has reminded those who seek to gain Jerusalem control, whoever proposes that we take the heart of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, and take it out of our hands, and that this would be bringing about peace, I say not only is this a mistake, but a fatal mistake. And Palestinian terrorists are everywhere. How about these friendly looking folks? They believe it is destiny for them to remove the Jews from their holy land and drive them into the sea. It sure looks like a religion of peace, doesn't it? Palestinian terrorism has targeted Jerusalem, particularly in an attempt to regain control of the city from Israel. The result is that they have turned Jerusalem, literally the city of peace, into a bloody battleground and have thus forfeited their claim to share in the city's destiny. They say every picture tells a story. Concerning the Temple Mount and its ultimate pursuit, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas continues to insist, it is our sacred place, Al-Aqsa is ours, this noble sanctuary, Muslims refer to as the Temple Mount, is ours. They have no right to go there and desecrate it, Abbas said. From a Palestinian website, we find this overarching principle and ideology. Not only do Palestinians have the oldest and longest running refugee pro population in the world, their home is at the center of a deeply contentious struggle to liberate Jerusalem, the capital of the world's three religions, and quite literally, the conscience and soul of humanity. Al-Qaeda leader Ayman Zawahiri has called on supporters worldwide to carry out lone wolf attacks against the West, in particular America, in a new speech calling the Muslims to unite for the liberation of Jerusalem. Friends, it's very obvious we are heading to Jerusalem at some point in time. It's a sure thing. It's biblical prophecy becoming very clear. The book of Daniel has become unsealed and its pictures of the final days will end up in Jerusalem, front and center. How about this video from Iran? A new video out of Iran presents the imagined scenario of Jerusalem being conquered by a military alliance of the country's Revolutionary Guard forces and Hezbollah and Hamas terrorists. This video was released two weeks after the Iran nuclear deal was announced. At the end, the Persian script appears, Israel must be obliterated or literally erased from the annals of history and the youth will definitely see that day come when it comes. And lo and behold, three weeks ago, November 21st, 2015, the headlines, Iran trains for capture of Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa but uses dome of rock model. The report says the forces stormed and liberated a replica of the mosque. They said that 120 brigades of Bazij, the paramilitary unit of the guards, occupied hypothetical enemy positions during Friday's exercise in the holy city of Qom in central Iran. If Iran has their way, they will stand in Jerusalem here pretty soon. Israel is very aware of Persia's intent. Concerning this imminent threat of Iran, the Prime Minister of Israel boldly declares Israel has waited patiently for the international community to resolve this issue. We've waited for diplomacy to work, we've waited for sanctions to work, and none of us can afford to wait much longer. As Prime Minister of Israel, I will never let my people live in the shadow of annihilation. Today, we have a state of our own, and the purpose of the Jewish state is to defend Jewish lives and secure the Jewish future. And defend it, they will. Out of the Times of Israel headline, 
the coming storm for Jerusalem. Here is this writer's perspective on how it all comes down. The storm will, obviously, begin at the Temple Mount. The scenario is simple. Jews want their Temple Mount back, while the West, along with their Islamic allies, say no. Now, I'm not so sure this will pan out like this writer says, but I do agree that the storm will begin at the Temple Mount, and from there, darkness will cover the whole earth. The prevailing mindset of the Middle East, as we've seen, is reflected in this prophetic song. They have said, come, let us wipe them out as a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. Israel will not be backing down, and oh, how we need peace and some semblance of security, as the world is saying at this moment. Maybe we ought to be looking for something much larger. It's called the Day of the Lord. In writing to the believing community, one Bible writer clearly states that we will not be caught off guard regarding the time of Jesus' return. He declares, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. What will be the prevailing concern before this day arrives? For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor planes upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Friends, this is a talk right now. Out of the Jerusalem Post, peace must be anchored in security. Yes, Israel wants peace, but Netanyahu says it must come with a guarantee of security. And Obama concurs. America's commitment to Israel's security is unshakable. Our friendship with Israel is deep and enduring. And so we believe that any lasting peace must acknowledge the very real security concerns that Israel faces every single day. Peace will not come through statements and resolutions at the United Nations. If it was that easy, it would have been accomplished by now. With all of this talk, some are opposed to it. So remember the words of Jesus. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. For there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. When we see this, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in the midst of the city depart, and let not those who are in the country enter the city. This will be no time to take in an Israel trip uh, to check out the Holy Land. At that time upon the earth there will be distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves are roaring. The prophet Zephaniah saw his day, and in this day near is the great day of the Lord, near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord, in it the warrior cries out bitterly, this is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Yes, the storm is approaching. The prophet Joel adds this portrait of this time, and it'll be a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, a people come, great and strong, of like of whom has never been seen, nor will there ever be any such after them. Many of the prophets had something to say about this time. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Speaking of this day, Ezekiel the prophet proclaims, You will sin, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops, and many peoples with you. And you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me. It's all going back there for reason, friend. But, uh-oh, you shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you. And I will give you to the birds of prey of every sort and to the beast of the field to be devoured. And I shall magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations and they will know that I am the Lord. And because he is a God of Israel, he is bringing it back to where it all started, on the mountain of Moriah. In its most concise terms, it will be a battle of the Almighty versus the one who started this rebellion in the first place, his name, Lucifer. One day, Jesus will come down to fight for Jerusalem. And in that day, his feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. 
You see, Lucifer has this great idea. I will ascend to the heaven and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. Friends, he will sit on that mountain and that will be the end of the matter. Case closed. And this shall be the plague which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets and their tongue shall dissolve in their mouths. In light of this, what should we be doing? It's time to blow the trumpet in Zion and sound it for it is at hand. If Paul said this 2,000 years ago, what do you think we should be saying today? He said a long time ago, and do this, knowing the time that now is a high time to wake up out of our sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The end is near, therefore let us watch and be sober. Friends, the night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Yes, Earth's final storm is approaching and Jerusalem is in its final days. We need to recognize we are on a collision course with eternity. So where are you headed? I have laid out for you the clear evidence that Jerusalem will be attacked sometime in the near future. Remember the words of Yeshua, Jesus, and now I have told you before it comes to pass that when it comes to pass, you may believe. Have you seen enough to make you a believer? If so, confess and believe it. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Then you need to believe and receive. But as many as have received him, to them he gave right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. You believe that Jesus died for your sins, was raised for your justification, and is coming back to give you an eternal home. You open up the door of your life and in your heart and ask him to come in and be your Lord and Savior. These are the things that are necessary to be prepared for his soon return. Jesus declares, Behold, I am coming quickly, and blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Take this, keep it in your heart. The storm is approaching, but the storm will pass over, and the storm will never return again. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And eyes have not seen, nor ears heard those things which he has prepared for those who love him. Friends, take heed to the warning. The storm is approaching. Jerusalem is in its final days. And friends, we're getting ready to go home. Well, friends, I hope that because of these three presentations, dealing with the sure word of prophecy, you are more convinced than ever that Jesus is Lord. The scripture gives you all kinds of prophecies outside of what I've shared with you about your own personal future. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, you will be saved. Possibly you're in a place where you're not there. But the scripture declares that if you will confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. One day, friends, we're gonna be in a place where there'll be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying. I know you're going through some stuff because everyone's going through it, but there's some hope and encouragement in the sure word of prophecy in these last three presentations. I hope have done something to help you to find your way to the throne of grace and mercy. Now may God bless you, keep you, cause his face to shine upon you and give you extreme peace and walk out in faith because we're getting ready to see the culmination of all the prophecies converging at the same time. And that storm is coming, but it's gonna pass and we're going home, friends. We're going home because he said in my father's house, or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I do, 
I am coming again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, you can be also. Are you there? Have you received him as your Lord and Savior? There's still time. Make that decision today. You don't know what tomorrow brings. Life is like a vapor. So friends, thank you for this opportunity to share with you. And if you want to chat with me, go to my website, email me over, I'll send you this presentation free of charge. I don't charge anything. I freely give, I freely receive. So be blessed.